um, our next speaker is uh, Antje Weisheimer. And uh, Antje kindly also gave a lecture last week. Um, she's at uh, ECMWF in the University of Oxford. And in her free time, Antje likes to ramble the English countryside. <laughs> Thank you, Judith. Nice memories from years back when you were uh, in England. Thanks for the possibility, opportunity to speak. Um, let me share my screen. Can you see that okay, Judith? Yeah, perfect. Okay, so so I'm I'm going to talk a little bit about um, some some recent work I've been doing with my colleagues from ESMWF and also from the Bureau of Metrology in in Australia on multi-decadal variability in in long-range El Nino predictions during the 20th century. And um, um, so the motivation for this really is, I mean, as I'm sure you all know that El Nino ENSO is arguably the most predictable climate mode at seasonal timescales, and it provides the, the scientific basis for global seasonal climate predictions. And over the last years and decades, uh, significant progress has been made in our understanding of, of ENSO and the complexity of ENSO, but also in the development of the observing system, systems, the, the, the model development of coupled GCMs, of data assimilation techniques to, to improve the initialization of forecasts. Um, and it's probably fair to say that current forecast models can provide effective predictions of El Nino warm and cold events um, approximately a year ahead, six to 12 months ahead. Estimates of, of this type of predictability and so skill are commonly, they're based on retrospective forecast, um, most commonly over the last two or three decades, which results in an overall quite small sample size of ENSO events. They come with substantial uncertainties in, in the skill estimates. On top of this problem is the small sample size. Um, the cadal scale changes in, in ENSO background states can make certain decades less predictable than others. And these background fluctuations can be seen as some spontaneously generated multi-decadal variations in, in ENSO diversity. So for example, I mean, I listed a few papers, older papers on, um, on this topic here. Um, changes in a tropical Pacific mean state related to the equatorial thermocline they have been suggested as a source of interdecadal modulation of the amplitude of, of interannual variability, ENSO variability, um, with, with an intensification of the ENSO signal observed in the, in the second half of the 20th century. So the, especially the, the papers by Kurtman and Schopf here and others um, looked a bit more in detail of how changes in the ENSO amplitude can affect ENSO predictability and they proposed um, a relationship between the amplitude and the variability and based on, on some sort of simple, simple models at the time, um, <clears throat> which, which sort of could be explained with the uh, classical theory of the delayed oscillator mechanism, which, which you know, robustly maintains self-sustained oscillation that drive the SSTs anomalies. Um, and so on, but also um, stochastic noise from the atmosphere, for instance, through westerly wind burst can influence SST anomalies. And, and it was shown that these affect them stronger during epochs when the delayed oscillator um, is perhaps damped by, by colder SSTs, um, leading them to overall reduced predictability. So and in first an attempt to, to re-forecast historical ends or events, was, was done in this sort of seminal paper by Chen et al, 2004, who run the Zibiak and Kane model uh, by initializing with some reconstructed SST data. So the Zibiak and Kane model, sort of model of the coupled Pacific tropical ocean atmosphere. And they showed in that, in that work that the answer predictability depends on, on the time period over which it's estimated and that periods with high skill were dominated by strong ENSO events. And, um, and yeah, I mean, basically motivated by these earlier studies, we, we here tried to, to use um, a state-of-the-art modern 
now with our standards nowadays, modern dynamical forecasting system, the ECNWF forecasting system, and try to revise where we are in terms of predictability based on these um, earlier works with the more, more ideal, idealistic um, model setups. So the purpose here is, of, of this work is, is twofold, twofold in a sense that we'd like to explore long range um, retrospective ENSO predictions in the 20th century. And when I say long range, I mean up to two years with a state of the art dynamical seasonal forecasting system. But we also wanted to test sensitivities to the, the ocean observing system and to atmospheric forcings here. So um, what, what we did is we created a, um, a set of hindcasts we forecast of the 20th century. We call them Cs5, 20C, Cs5, because they were done with the with ECWFs. Um, there was a version of ECWFs operational seasonal forecasting system, Cs5. A version meaning we're using the same model as such, but we run it in a lower resolution because we couldn't afford the, the higher resolution of the operational forecast. So it's the resolution of TCO 199, 91 vertical levels. That's roughly um, how many kilometers? I think it was order of 60 kilometers. And the ocean version, uh, the ocean model has a resolution of one degree with 42 levels. We, we run forecasts during the 20th century here over the period from 1901 to 2010 for two start dates per year. We initialize on the 1st of May and the 1st of November over these 110 years and let the model uh, run for 24 months. So we have this biennial forecast here with an ensemble size of 10 members because the focus here was really El Nino. This was possible due to the availability of the CIRA 20C coupled reanalysis from ESMWF, which covered exactly this period, which we used to initialize these coupled um, predictions, we forecast. Um, just a few words on the CIRA 20C reanalysis. So it's a coupled reanalysis that comprises the atmosphere, land, but also wave, ocean, and sea ice. It assimilates only surface pressure and marine winds in the atmosphere and for the for the ocean, it assimilates subsurface temperatures and salinity profiles. So with this data, um, we created uh, our reforecast experiment, our control experiment as labeled Cs 520 c this, this table here gives an overview of the initial conditions. So the, in, the, in this control experiment, the atmospheric land um, initial conditions as well as the ocean and sea ice initial conditions come from this coupled reanalysis, coupled CIRA 20C that uses data assimilation. Um, atmospheric forcing, it's, it's a coupled setup, but um, we, we then run some sensitivity experiments with a similar setup where um, we tested the influence of the ocean observations. So we have experiments without data assimilation, no DA in the ocean, which use the same atmosphere and land initial conditions from Sierra 20 c and the atmospheric forcing, so this is not a coupled, there wasn't a coupled setup in the initialization, came from also from Sierra 20 c This is the orange, the second line here. And then we, we have two experiments where we force the ocean initial conditions with a different atmospheric forcing. And it instead of coming from Sierra 20 c it comes from ERA 20C, which is the previous generation of atmospheric reanalysis of the 20th century, which was atmosphere only. So the forcing that the ocean initial conditions uh, saw is different. And we have two experiments here, one with ocean data assimilation and one without. So we're interested in the skill. And um, here is perhaps an overview plot of how the NINO 3.4 SST ensemble mean um, anomaly correlation skill has changed over the 20th century, over a hindcast period. Um, based on the November 1st initialization here, and I, let me talk you through this plot. So we see on the x-axis, the time of the reforecast period, it goes from 1901 to 2010. And we compute the skill over 30 year moving windows, hindcast windows. So each point in this plot is, is estimated over a 30 year window. 
and plotted at the center in the middle of that 30 year window. That's why you have these, you know, the white ends at the beginning and the end of the period. And then the, the Y axis shows the lead time of the forecast, our two years, and it goes from, from bottom to top. Um, so we start in November. So the first season here is DJF, and this is a three months moving window across the lead time here in the vertical axis. The colors indicate a level of skill, um, the correlation skill, and the, the, the dashed areas are um, periods in, in terms of hind cusp periods and lead time where the skill is not significant according to, to a simple t-test. So what do we see? We see lots of interesting things. You can look at this plot and, and from, from, from various ways. And um, let me just start with one perhaps. So if we do cross sections here for different epochs in the hindcast uh, period, you, um, you can see how the skill behavior over lead time changes. And this is shown in the plot below. So if we take the last um, data point here, plotted at around 95, which, which is made up of the third, it, it includes the data from the last 30 years in our hindcast period, hindcast period. And we, do a cross section across lead time, we end up with the red curve in the plot below here. So we see the solid lines is from our simulations and the dotted line, the red dotted line is a simple persistence forecast, persisting the initial conditions, the SSTs. And we see that we have, um, we have to, you know, after the first um, Enzo peak season, we, we reach the predictability sort of barrier, the spring barrier here. But after that, we have a quite a long, like, like almost a year long period of, of a plateau of very high levels of skill, highly significant here. And then we reach the second um, spring barrier and then we, we lose the skill after that for, for the latest forecast period. If we go to, um, to say a period here in the middle where we see that we lose lots of skill um, after the first spring barrier here is lots of non-significant uh, skill lead times here. This is the blue line in the plot below. And we see already right from the beginning, uh, the behavior is quite different. The skill drops much quicker. And uh, we, we observe also like a plateau of skill, but is, is hardly significant here. And um, it shows like quite reduced levels of skill after this spring barrier out on seasonal, longer seasonal timescales. And then at the very beginning of the century, interestingly, um, we see in the yellow line here, the first on the seasonal timescales, the first months behave relatively similar to our most recent period, high levels of skill. We reach a plateau after the spring barrier, which is a bit lower than the one for the most recent period, but still significant in terms of levels of skill. And then again, in this sort of after the second spring barrier, we lose that skill here as well. Um, I mentioned that we did, uh, oh yeah, this is another way of looking at it, of course, uh, cross sections, not across lead time, but across hindcast period. So this is now looking at the first winter season, the peak season of El Nino, uh, lead time two to four months, cross section here. Um, as indicated by the black line. Just look at the red line for now, which is our control experiment. And you see similar to findings um, that people from, from, from CPC found, uh, we, we have a long period from the most recent decades to the roughly 1960s, where the level of El Nino skill forecast here is, is constantly very high. You see that is, is 0.9 something here for a long period of time. And then around the 1960s, the skill drops a bit. And there's a prolonged period of a few decades where the skill is lower to roughly the 1930s. And then the skill goes up again. And the, the skill at the beginning of the century is very high. It's almost as high as at the, the current for the latest periods in that, in that, in that century. The gray band show, gives an idea of the uncertainty of course, with the correlation skill, we have an upper limit of the uncertainty there at one, but you see that also the uncertainty has much increased during that period when we have a bit of a drop of skill. I should say, because this is El Nino, when I speak about a drop of skill, this is still high levels of skill in terms of 
other parts of the world, we're still talking about 0.9 correlation skill in the periods where it's where it's lower. And, and if you look, for instance, you have about three minutes or so to wrap up. OK, thank you, Judith. Yeah. Uh, if you look at the second DJF season, so this is then lead time 14 to 16 months, we can do a similar uh, cross section here. Again, just look at the red line and we see some interesting variability as well. And during that period in the 1930s, 40s, the skill then becomes um, non significant here, where it is. It, it still is at, at, at the beginning of the century and at the end of the century here. Just to mention, we did these experiments to test the sensitivity to the ocean observing system, the data simulation system. And we see on the left hand side um, at the top, the experiment I just showed you, the control one, the same plot. And below there is the experiment where we don't assimilate ocean observations for the initial conditions. And you see, if you compare these two, you see the impact that the ocean observations have for skill, especially in the second half of the 20th century, when we have relatively good observations in the ocean, um, we see how beneficial the, the ocean observing system is on these lead times after the first spring barrier in particular. But we also see that the levels of skill at the beginning of the century are not much affected by, by, by the, you know, the changes in the observing system or the assimilation of these data here. Just briefly on the right hand side, you see the sensitivity to the atmospheric forcing. So using a different atmosphere to, in, to, to, to force the ocean initial data. And there we see a clear sensitivity at the beginning of the century where, where the, the sensitivity is most pronounced here. And again, you can do all kinds of games of doing cross section. And we see for these sensitivities, we see a clear separation. Perhaps it's clearest to see on the bottom right plot that the two lines that have the highest skill are the ones that uh, use data assimilation in the last decades, in the last part of, of our hindcast periods. Whereas the two um, simulations without data assimilation really have lower skill here. This is very different at the beginning of the century. At the beginning of the century, it's the, uh, it's the simulation that used the forcing from the Sierra 20C atmosphere that have higher skill, and the ones that use the forcing from the other atmospheric data set have a lower skill. So there's some interesting sensitivity behavior here over, over time. Also interesting, but I won't talk about it now, is the behavior for different initialization time of the year in the May start days. As we all know, um, ENSO has a strong sensitivity to a seasonal cycle and it is clearly visible in these other start dates. But just to mention as a possible explanation for some of this behavior, and I mentioned it in the introduction perhaps, we, we know that the ENSO amplitude, the, M, the, the ENSO interannual variability has, has undergone a strong increasing um, trend from the middle of the century to the end of the century. This is here shown in the black line, again, 30 year moving window. And it was hypothesized that this increase in the amplitude, the signal strengths, um, is, is one of the reasons why predictability, why these skill measures went up for, for these periods as well. And um, well, I won't have time to, to talk about loads of this. I just want to show you, if you look at the red line, this is the, the similar estimate from the model that forecast um, with a lead time two to four months. And it's it's good to see the model are able to simulate that increase in, in ENSO uh, variability in the second half of the century as well. But you also see that at the beginning of the century, when the amplitude was also relatively high, that is not so well predicted on, on seasonal timescales with our models here. And if we look at the other colors, these are the longer lead times, we lose that behavior and the amplitude completely. But let me briefly summarize. Um, so I, I was trying to show you some results from an interesting data set that we recently produced using the ESMWF forecasting system um, over a long period, hindcast period from 1901 onwards. Um, we looked at the multi-decadal variability of ENSO skill and found constant and quite high levels of skill from at least the 1960s onwards um, up to the first spring barrier. And we, we also noticed a clear benefit of the recent ocean observations um, with the skill extending up to the second spring barrier here, 18 months. 
but also saw a pronounced in the media drop in skill between the 1930s and 1960s, um, and then before that, uh, the earlier decades of the 20th century high school, despite the poor observational coverage, which is interesting. We saw some sensitivity to the atmospheric forcing, especially for the first part of the century, and um, the importance of the spring barrier, especially for the May star dates. I hadn't, didn't talk much about it. But that, that uh, for us is some interesting motivation of maybe looking at longer term predictions, skillful predictions, uh, also for like perhaps the future operational systems here. And there are several hypotheses for, for the, the, the causes of this non-stationarity in the skill to do with the amplitude, the interannual variability. And we saw the last slide, some of these behavior, but also with changes in the intrinsic persistence characteristics, which, which I didn't show here, but we're looking at these and variability of the discharge and re recharge strengths in the ENSO cycle. And with this, I thank you very much. Thank you very much. We have time for a question or so, please. Oh yeah, Zane has one, please go ahead. Hi, Anji. Um, I really like that talk. Hi. I was wondering if, if you looked at the thoughts, some of the talks yesterday made me think about this potential predictability in these runs, you know, can you, can you have a bunch of ensemble members. So have you, have you thought about that at all and whether that, you know, you maybe wouldn't expect it to change over time, but then again, like, I don't know what to expect. So ha have you looked at that or thought about that? Um, good question, Zane. I think I did as just too many data to remember at the moment. I, I didn't notice anything spectac spectacular, but I, I should have updated myself a little bit on this. Um, in terms of so, um, right, nothing spectacular, you mean it was just it was just flat pretty much over time. There wasn't much change. I don't think it was as, as dramatic as what we saw in the cool. actual predictability estimates. Yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah, you might expect yeah. that. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. I, I actually will um, ask a related question. And this is, have you looked at that in like some really long simulations? I mean, with CSM, we have like a thousand years. And so it would just give you more data to look at that modulation of the NAO and ENSO. Um, NAO, uh, NAO is the other talk. I, I know people have done this. I mean, Richard Greatbatch group, they, they, they have been looking at some pre-industrial CMIP simulation and so for, for the, more the, the teleconnections into the exotropics. Um, unfortunately for the Eastern WF model, we don't have these long simulations. Right. So, no, no, yeah, no, um, I was thinking. I no, I, I, I'm more coming from the prediction, you know, the operational aspect right. of the... Um, I, I, I fully agree that would be interesting to do. And I, I'm sure people have done and, and found, I mean, these earlier, earlier works, I guess, when the initialization was a bit more of a problem, people looked at free running models um, to, to check uh, variability there. And uh, there, there is quite a lot of literature out there. I haven't looked at it myself. Thanks so much. Are there, uh, uh, Jacqueline has a question. We'll make this the last in-person question. Hi, thank you for the talk. Uh, I was wondering if you have looked at physical processes. I've You showed that the um, model has a high score for the leading times of from two to four months, and that it's an indication that the model is picking up the ENSO of the El Nino set, right? There are physical processes already in the Central Pacific, perhaps higher uh, or warmer SSD anomalies or like weaker trade winds. I was just wondering if you kind of went beyond just the correlation analysis to look at like what insights do we have from the models itself? Yeah, um, it's very much ongoing work to, to, um, to, to look at this data. And um, so we, we have looked at a bit of like trying to see mechanisms with the um, ocean heat content and the discharge recharge mechanism, and especially with the view of trying to explain the different behavior in the different epochs there. And there's some indication from, also from this sort of persistent autocorrelation behavior uh, that you can see that the, the atmospheric uh, wind forcing things, I haven't had a time yet to look at. I mean, one of the purpose of this was really also, I should have said is clear that, that um, 
we, we very much invite people to look at the data. It's a huge uh, amount of data available, a resource for several questions. And uh, we have collaborations with the Australians, for instance, who look at certain aspects. And uh, I, I don't have enough time to look at all these things, but if people are interested, we would be very happy to share this for, for, my, for more explorations, really. All right, thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you.